Before I begin, I just want to thank somebody publicly, Mr. Media Dave. Uh, I am not a PowerPoint person, and I'm not really good at it at all. And so I do my really rough, bad versions, and I send them to Pastor Dave, uh, or to Dave, and rather than sending it back to me, he actually fixes it himself. Uh, probably because he knows what would happen if he sent it back to me. I'd just come back. So, Dave, I very, very much appreciate that. I know you don't have to, uh, so I appreciate it. In his book, Proof, uh, Timothy Paul Jones uh, tells the story of taking their adopted daughter to Disney World. Very sadly, their adopted daughter had actually been adopted by another family first. And I didn't know you could do this, maybe you can only do it in the States, but after two years of having her, they annulled the adoption. And, and then even while they had her, whenever they would go on trips, including to Disney World, they always took only their biological children. And the adopted girl always had to stay uh, with family friends. Uh, and so uh, she always believed that this is because she had done something wrong or because she was a bad girl. Uh, they never told her why they didn't take her, but that's what she assumed. That's what she uh, believed. And finally, now that she's living with the Jones family, she finally got to go and experience the magic kingdom. She finally got to see it. And on their way home, she said something utterly profound to her dad. She said, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good it's because I'm yours. What a, an illustration, a picture, a, a message of outrageous grace. And it's outrageous because we can never achieve it. We can never grasp it by being good. It's just a gift. It just, it's just because we're gods, because we belong to God, that we receive this, this outrageous grace from him. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether you are a brand new Christian or whether you're not a Christian. You only know what it means to be a Christ follower or whether you have been a Christian for 98 years. <laughs> we still all need that grace. There doesn't come a time in our Christian walk where we can say, I am now mature enough that I don't need to rely on God's grace. And so we need to be uh, reminded over and over and over again of this tremendous need for God's amazing grace. We cannot become a Christian without the grace of God. Uh, we, we cannot live the Christian life without the grace of God. We cannot enter eternity with God without his grace. And that's why one of my favorite hymns will always be Amazing Grace by John Newton. Uh, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. "'Tis grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home." But at the same time, I find that sometimes the grace is a little bit like the word love. We all want it, we all need it, we're all aware of it, but we're not quite sure. How do we define it? How do we describe what grace is? And, and so we have some common definitions, I'm sure you've heard them. The unmerited favor of God, love in action, undeserved mercy. In his book, Growing Deep in the Christian Life, Chuck Swindoll defines it this way. Grace is what God does for mankind, which we do not deserve, which we cannot earn, and which we will never be able to repay. And that, very simply to me, is what grace is. Grace is what we do not deserve. None of us deserve God's grace. We don't deserve God's forgiveness, but we get it. How? How? Through his grace. We don't deserve to have a relationship with God. But we have it, if we're Christians, through God's grace. And this one always amazes me. Because of God's grace, 
we have the privilege of calling the Almighty God, the God who spoke the word into the universe with just his words, spoke, spoke, the, spoke the universe into existence with just his words, and we get to call him Father. Now, I don't know about you, but that shivers my timbers. That just amazes me that I can call that God Father because of the grace of God. And so I want to read a short passage of Scripture. And I think that there are some valuable lessons here in terms of understanding God's grace. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And I, I find three lessons in this short passage about the grace of God. The first thing that we see is the provision of God's grace. And God's grace is given us in one way and one way only through Christ. There is no other way to get it. It is, a, it is from Christ himself. In verse 14, it says that Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us. And in his gospel, John reminds us that yes, Moses gave us the law, but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. And friends, grace is not a reward for righteous living. It's not because we're so good. It's not because I pray for four hours a day. It's not because I give 25% of my money. It is a pure, unadulterated gift from God through Christ and through Christ alone. And so we must never lose sight of the fact that from the very beginning, and in some ways even before the beginning of our Christian life, to the very end of our Christian life, we need this gift, this gift from Christ that comes only through him. The second thing we see is not just that it is provided by Christ, but it's provided for all. Provided for all. The opening verse in the text tells us that God's grace has appeared to all men, to all people. And God tells us in 1, Corinthians, in 1 Timothy 2.4 that God wants all men, all men, all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And later it says that he died as a ransom for all men. You see, there is no one on the face of the earth that has ever lived, that is living today or will ever live that is not a candidate for the grace of God. Every last person that has ever been born is a candidate. Whether they choose to receive it is up to them. I remember being at a Youth for Christ banquet in Brandon several years ago. And the guy who was speaking was talking about a lady in Halifax that ran a, a, a ministry for street kids. And she was asking a particular church for for financial support. And they asked her this question. How many of these kids have you led to Christ? And her response was, all of them. It doesn't mean that they chose to receive, but she brought everybody to Christ. Introduced him, and then they had to make the decision what they were going to do. And so we all need that to, to have that. So if you're sitting here this morning and, and you have lived a life of utter, total sinfulness, that maybe you're like me, as I shared the, when I preached before, that the only time the words uh, of God came from my mouth was, was as curse words. I lived on the streets. I stuck needles in my arms. All of those things. And I was not a candidate. For Christianity. But God in his grace. Reached down and put someone in my life. That I just needed to hear more about Christ. 
You know, it, the Bible talks about the fact that we're salt and light. One of the things that this man was, he was salt in my life because he made me thirsty. I was not a searcher. I wasn't a seeker. I thought Christianity was weird. I used to say the Bible was written by people stoned on opium. I thought it was weird. In fact, I remember that the first night we were at this man's house, Wendy and I were there visiting with his wife and him, and he was a fairly new Christian, and I remember driving home and saying, I can't believe Tom's a Christian. I thought he was so normal. <laughs> because Christians weren't normal. But he made me thirsty. He made me thirsty. And eight or nine months later, I surrendered my life. Or maybe you're here and you've lived an upright, moral life. You received Christ in the womb and you've never, ever swayed. But beloved, the one thing we have to understand is that the grace of God is for you too. The grace of God is for all of us. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've rarely been to church. Maybe this is the first time you've been in church for Years, perhaps, except for weddings and, and, and funerals. And you don't even know what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm here to say that God's grace is for you. Or, or, or you're here and you've been in church all of your life. You received Christ at an early age. And you've lived for God faithfully for many years. But God's grace is for you. God's grace has been provided for everyone. And we can never lose sight of that. Regardless of how good or bad we might feel we are, how rich or poor we are, how smart or lack of smart we are, and even whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, God's grace is for you. But there does seem to be one Criteria, and I want to use that word loosely, but one criteria to receive the grace of God. And it's found in the book of James where it says that God gives grace to the humble. But doesn't that make sense though? Why would a prideful people need God's grace? Because they don't think they need God. They think that they don't need him. My wife's brother, Ross, uh, was a genius. And I mean that. He was a genius. He was a millionaire by the time he was 30. Absolutely rejected God in every way, shape, or form. He would mock us because we were Christians. And then he got cancer. And you know what? It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are you can still die of cancer. And in the midst of that, he discovered for the first time in his life, God's grace. And he received Christ, and though he died several years later, he died as a believer because he discovered the grace of God. And he thought God could never accept him because of how he had mocked before. You see, it takes humility to understand and to admit that I cannot be right with God on my own. That I needed someone to intervene for me, Jesus Christ. It takes humility to admit that, whether you've been working with God for, walking with God for many years, to understand that I am just as much in need of God as a person who doesn't know him at all. And so, friends, I encourage you today, I encourage you tomorrow and the next day 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 and the next day, to every day take a moment to simply bow before God with, on your knees or in your heart and just say, God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your grace. Thank you that through your grace I am your child. Thank you that through your grace I can walk with you in power. So we understand the provision of grace. But we also see in this text the purpose of grace. In verse 11 it says that God's grace saves us. We can't make ourselves right with God. We all know that here. But I wonder, as Pastor Barry shared, was it you that shared it last week, Pastor Barry? Maybe I was at a conference this week and maybe that was there. 
that we sometimes end up like the Galatians, that we know that we're saved by grace, but we think that I have to stay saved by my own works. And I have to work hard to stay saved. We can't make ourselves worthy enough to stand in the presence of God. But God's grace provided a way, a way to a lost humanity to be able to stand in his presence. Again, I mentioned earlier that that it comes through Jesus, through Christ and him alone, through the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ. We stand before God clean and free. Each and every one of us, again, whether you live the kind of life I lived or the kind of life where you've never turned to the left or to the right. You've always been a faithful follower of God. Regardless of which lifestyle you lived, God sent his son for us. And each and every person on the face of the, face of the earth needs to be set free. And God's grace is available, beloved. Paul reminds Titus, he reminds us that God gave himself for us. He became our substitute. Here's the thing, friends. We deserved to die. Now, we don't like to admit that, but we deserve to die. But in 1 Peter 2.24, it says that he himself bore our sins on his body in the tree, on the tree. And to redeem means to, to set free by paying a price. And Jesus paid that price, the price that you could not pay, that I could not pay, that none of us could pay. The second purpose of God's grace is that God changes us. Grace changes us. And I fear sometimes that those of us who have been walking with God for a number of years stop at the first part, that grace saves us. And we stop there. Not realizing that grace changes us. If we want to become more and more conformed to the image of Christ, we must fall at the feet of Christ and plead for his grace. It frees us from the power of sin, but it also changes us. It makes us more godly. God's grace teaches us to be the kind of people who glorify him with our words and our actions in our lives. Paul says that that God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And my guess is for many of us is this. When we recognize ungodliness in our lives, the first thing that many of us do is decide to work harder. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read my Bible more. And those are not necessarily bad things to do at all, of course. But maybe what we need to do instead is to say, God, fill me with more and more and more of an understanding of your grace. That's what I need. And as we get in touch with God's grace and see how much his grace means to us, how much he loves us to give us that grace, we less and less and less want to be involved in ungodly things. It teaches us to say no to worldly passions, to the interests and the desires that would help us to put our focus on God above other things those worldly passions. And I'll be frank, this is what I see happening in the church so much. I just met with a group of pastors this week. And one of the things we got talking about around the supper table one night was just how much, how many of our pastor friends and people in our churches have fallen due to worldly passions. And we deal with that with God's grace. God's grace doesn't just teach us what not to do. It tells us what to do. To live self-controlled lives. Lives that are balanced in, our, in every way. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. But to live balanced lives. It teaches us to, to live upright lives. Lives of righteousness and holiness and honor. To do as Ephesians 4 1 says. To live a life worthy of the calling that we have as Christ's children. God's grace teaches us to live godly lives. The Amplified Bible says it this way. 
godly lives, lives with a purpose that reflects spiritual maturity, to live a life that brings honor to God. And again, friends, I, and I, I'm not going to apologize for repeating this over and over and over again, that the only way we can live that kind of life is only, only, only through the grace of God. His grace teaches us and enables us to live lives of self-control and righteousness and godliness. And then, here's the amazing thing, His grace says, I want you to live this kind of life. But here's the thing. We're all going to fall. We're not always going to live the life that we ourselves desire to live. And guess what happens? God appears with his grace again. Can you imagine? I have grandchildren, and if they were learning to walk, and when they fell down, I grabbed them and I shook them, and I said, what a loser you are. You're six months, you should be walking by now. But we don't do that as parents or grandparents, do we? My grandson or granddaughter could be six years old and not walking, and I still think they're a genius. What do we do? We bend down. We get down on our knee and we lift them up. And we say, keep going, you can do it. You can do it. And that's what God does to us. He says, here's how I want you to walk. And I give you the grace to enable you to do it. And so we walk that way, and guess what happens? We fall flat on our face. And what does God do? He comes, reaches down, picks us up, and says, here's my grace. Keep walking. I'm with you. You're not walking alone. I'll strengthen you. You're doing all right. Keep going. And so we need his grace both to live that life and to help us when we fall in living that life. And then finally, we talk about the scripture shows us about the provision of God's grace and the the purpose of God's grace. But I think this is so powerful, the power of God's grace. We often don't think of the power of God's grace. But God's grace has the power to turn even the most rebellious servant into a mighty servant of God. Just think of the same man who's writing this book, the Apostle Paul. He hated Christians. He hated them. He was a a, 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 a Pharisee of Pharisees. He attacked Christians. He threw them in prison. And then one day... He's riding his horse on the way to Damascus to do what? To throw more, prison, more Christians yet into prison. And he has this glorious encounter with Jesus Christ. He surrenders his life to him and goes on to become one of the most significant leaders in the very history. Not the first century, but the very history of the church. He led countless people to Christ. He planted I don't know how many churches... And when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church to explain all of this, here's what he said. Is it going to be up? Just how many words, times a particular word here is used. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Do you think grace was important to Paul? Three times in one verse, he reminds the Corinthian church that everything that's happened in his life, everything that he has accomplished, is not because of who he is, but because of the grace of God. Not only, and only the grace, sorry, not only the grace of God has the power to make someone an effective, fruitful Christian. And again, I think sometimes we think that we have to earn that, that we have to work for that. But we, if we serve according to the grace that's given us. Romans 12, 6 says this. We have different gifts 
according to what? The grace that is given us. We have spiritual gifts that empower us to serve. Empower us and enable us and empassion us to serve. But I think that so many of us in the church won't step out to serve because we're afraid that we will fail. And let me put your mind at rest. You will. We all will. I remember talking to a new staff member and he said, I'm just so worried about falling flat on my face. And I said, but you're going to. We're all going to. I pastored for 34 years and, and even in the last few months I pastored, I can count half a dozen or more times that I fall, fell flat on my face. But we have to understand that we don't serve in our own power. We don't serve in our own abilities. We step out in faith with the gifts that God has given us by his grace. In the last number of years that I pastored, the last 25 years, I taught a course that I called team building that helped people discover their gifts, their passions, and their temperaments. And people were amazed to discover that they had gifts. Because you see, they thought they were one of the only people in the history of the church that didn't have gifts. Even though God says, I give gifts to all people, they thought that they weren't part of that all. Discover your gifts and operate in them. So we cannot become a Christian without grace. We cannot effectively live the Christian life without grace. So again, I encourage us on a daily basis to bow humbly before our God and to thank him. God, I thank you for the provision of your grace. I thank you for the purpose of your grace. I thank you, God, for the power of your grace in my life.